Hello, I'm Stan Rhodes. Thanks for joining us. Well, today we're going to look at the origins of addiction to help us better understand the disease, the science behind it, and where it comes from. According to a definition from the American Society of Addiction Medicine, addiction is a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. The definition continues on to say, this is reflected in an individual pathologically pursuing reward and or relief by substance use and other behaviors. Well, to help us all understand the complexity surrounding the origins of addiction, two scientists from the National Institute on Drug Abuse, known as NIDA, are with me today on the program. Dr. Ruben Baller is part of NIDA's science policy branch. He is an expert on neurobiology of drug abuse and addiction. Dr. Stephen Grant is the chief of the clinical neuroscience branch at NIDA. His expertise involves human brain imaging, cognitive neuroscience, and brain pharmacology. Well, Ruben and Stephen, welcome to the program. Glad you're here. Help us understand better the, how addiction works and how it relates to brain activity. Why don't we first start? Ruben, explain to me the, you call it the evolution of the brain how it has changed. Well, it actually turns out, and we haven't really been paying too much attention to this, that evolution, understanding the history of our brains, have a very important role to play in our understanding of addiction. Uh, the fact is that the, our brains have evolved to do, perform very specific functions and under certain very specific circumstances. So whenever we move the brain and we ask from the brain to do things that are, have not been predicted or seen during its evolution, the brain may run into trouble. Mm -hmm. Well, Stephen, I think of the three R's, I think of reading, writing, and arithmetic, but, but in your line of work, the three R's are a little different. Yes, the, in terms of brain organization, the important principles is first that the brain is regulatory, that the brain regulates both the internal environment of the organism as well as moving the organism through the external environment. Second, the brain is redundant. That is, it's, it has many, many layers that perform the same function. And so there are often competition between different parts of the brain to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the third part is that it's recurrent, which means that it feeds back on itself which generally is not something that in engineering, let's say, or electronics, is considered to be a good thing, that the output goes back into the input. If you have a thermostat, for example, that's how a thermostat works and keeps the temperature constant, that's fine. However, you can also feed back information that is more um, of the same and you can actually get a positive feedback which is explosive, but that's very good in producing change. Is there an order to the three R's? No. Okay. How does the brain protect itself? Well, one of the main ways that the brain protects itself is using exactly evolutionary, the concept of flexibility versus adaptability. During evolution, the brain has evolved this capacity to be both flexible and very adaptable. So it tries to adapt itself to the things and the changes in the environment, both external and internal, mm -hmm. that are changing all the time. Think about day and night, for example. These are changes that can be predicted and that the brain can adapt itself to. So the brain has evolved these mechanisms to be very robust to things that has seen in its past. And it has these mechanisms molecular and genetically driven to adapt to changes in its environment. Does the brain have constraints? Does it know what it can, what it can't do, what it shouldn't do? Well, there are physical and genetic and molecular constraints. There are limits like any machine mm -hmm. that can work within those optimal minima and maxima, as we say. And whenever we demand from this machine that we carry in our skulls to go beyond those limits, there are constraints that are expressed, manifested in things like addiction, for Th example. Does that vary from person to person? Absolutely. There are many uh, variables at the genetic level, for example, mm -hmm. that will determine uh, a, ver a huge uh, range of variability between, individual, uh, between different individuals. Does our brain fill in information much like a computer does? Does it fill it in, like perhaps you leave a word out? Does it fill things in? 
Well, this is part of what the brain has evolved to do, is to be very efficient at constructing narratives based on partial information. This is what the brain does very, very well. So it picks up partial information from the environment and tries to create a narrative that makes sense and that it allows the brain to predict and simulate realities to chart the course of action mm -hmm. uh, that ho hopefully will be appropriate for the present circumstances. Does this activity happen in all parts of the brain, just certain parts? Uh, the brain activity really is distributed in many, for many, many different functions. So mm -hmm. uh, it's true that there are many areas of the brain that are active at a particular point of time, but there are nodes in the brain that perform predominantly one function versus another. When we get thrown off with something, we're, we're driving down the road and a cat or a dog or something comes across and it throws us off, does the brain try to, to balance us, to get us back on course? What, what does it do? Well, yeah, the brain is exactly that. It's trying to adapt to surprising events, always within certain limits, and it's uh, extremely capable of doing that. This is why we are wired for distraction, because things that are out of the ordinary and unexpected are very, uh, very, in very salient, very important, very significant for the brain. And the brain tends to pay uh, heightened attention to the things that happen out of the ordinary. You mentioned it's fragile, but yet it's, what, robust? Robust. Well, this comes out of this evolutionary driven balance of trying to uh, combine flexibility and adaptability. You need to be adaptable to changes in the environment. You need to be flexible because changes may be sometimes out of the ordinary. Mm -hmm. How does the brain react to something it's, it's never seen before? Pathologically, I would say. An addiction is a perfect example. Uh, if evolution has not uh, shown during evolution, the brain has not seen something. Chances are that the adaptation to that something will be maladaptive. And addiction is a perfect example of that. What about dealing with something in excess or maybe deficiency? How does the brain deal with that? Steve, I'll throw that question okay. to you. Well, the brain, as I said, is regulatory. Mm -hmm. So it. That's back to the three it, R's. That's right. Um, unfortunately, the brain is not perfectly regulatory. The brain has evolved to deal with some types of deficiencies, for example, very well, like the loss of blood, which would indicate um, an injury. However, the brain is not well adapted to deal with an excess of blood, high blood pressure. Mm. That's why blood is called, uh, high blood pressure is called the silent killer. Mm -hmm. There's no way that the brain has evolved to detect high blood pressure because it's not something that it was evolutionarily exposed to. Same thing with the excess of um, high fat or high caloric sweet mm -hmm. um, food items. They were generally scarce in the environment, so it was adaptive to gather and have as much as that as you could while you could because there was no guarantee you would have that in the future. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, um, now that we have this in great abundance, the brain is not well adapted to deal with the excess. So it doesn't tell us to stop. It doesn't put those stop signs up and tell us to quit. Not as well as it would for other types of things, hmm. yes. Does the brain deal with, with and, and you're talking about excess, how does it deal with alcohol or with drugs? How does it, does it not have the stop gap there? The stop sign? Well, remember that drugs act on the brain. Mm -hmm. And the way that drugs act on the brain can often impair those very mechanisms that either tell you to go or to stop. And therefore, it Im drugs can impair, especially those that lead to addiction the very brain mechanisms that are involved in choice, in inhibition, or seeking items in the environment, goal seeking. Hmm. Well. well, let's take a deeper look into our topic. Researchers are always trying to learn more about what makes the brain work. And NIDA has a team of scientists working at their intramural research labs, or IRP, in Baltimore, Maryland. The findings could lead to new prevention and treatment methods. Let's look at some of the science behind the science to better understand the origins of addiction. 
My name is Brandon Harvey, and I am the director of the Optogenetics and Transgenic Technology Corps here at the NIDA Intramural Research Program. One of the primary objectives of this lab is to build molecular tools for dissecting out the genetic components of addiction. In terms of the advances that are occurring in addiction now, much of it relies on molecular biology tools and being able to manipulate neurons at a genetic level. This all starts with DNA. So what we are trying to create are viral vectors that we use as delivery vehicles. So these are viruses that have been genetically modified so they no longer have the virus properties other than the ability to deliver DNA into a cell. After we have the DNA made that can be used to make a virus, we need to put it into mammalian cells. And in this case, we're using the mammalian cells as a factory to produce virus. We get that concentrated virus in a small tube. And from there, the virus goes into a rodent brain into specific regions. So it's directly injected into the brain. And once we do that, we need to verify that we actually got the gene delivered to the cells that we were interested in, the region of the rat brain that we're interested in. So to do that, what we do is we freeze the brains and we section them very thinly and look at them on slides and using a, a microscope. Interesting stuff going on in those labs and we'll see more of the science behind the science throughout this program. Well, did you have any response to this at all before we move on that you wanted to maybe add? Well, these are really exciting techniques, and there are yes, some are. preclinical. We are far away from using some of these techniques of injecting viruses, for example, in the brain of a human. But some preclinical work uh, shows from several years ago, actually, that you can uh, indeed reduce alcohol consumption, for example, by injecting specific genes using these type of vehicles in the brains of little rodents. So uh, these have a lot of implications for research, for under understanding the genetics behind addiction, but also eventually for translating those into the clinic. Let's continue talking more about the, the brain during addiction. Is there something that triggers addiction within the brain? Well, what, what triggers addiction, the first step, is the drug. The drug enters the brain. And that drug could be alcohol or a, an illicit drug? Illicit drug. Mm -hmm. It could be a um, drug that's used for medical purposes. Mm -hmm like Adderall or um, opiates for pain, okay. um, cigarettes, any kind of drug. Okay, so it triggers. It goes into the brain. Mm -hmm. And there are two things that we have found out that are critical for addiction. One is that the drug has some influence on a system in the brain known as the dopamine system that uses a chemical, a group of neurons, a small group of neurons that use the chemical dopamine to communicate with other cells. The second thing we found out is that the consequences of that drug reach deep into the functioning of the cell. It actually will reach all the way into the level of gene expression. It'll change the target cell. It'll make it grow or shrink, which will in turn change other cells that it's connected to. And so the effects of the drug propagate throughout the entire nervous system. And with chronic use, parts of the brain that are far removed from the initial site of drug action can be altered. Now step back just a moment, explain to me, what is dopamine, what is its purpose? Well, dopamine, to, to understand dopamine, we again need to look at the evolution of the brain. Dopamine is a signal molecule, it has many, many different roles, mm -hmm. but its main purpose in the context of a drug abuse and addiction is really a teaching tool. It's an instrument, a chemical that the brain, through evolution, uses to recognize a salient feature of the environment, something that is important, that has survival value, a heightened fitness value for survival, and that the animal hopefully will repeat. It's designed to uh, show the animal where food was, where mates that with whom he can engage in mating behavior are found, or behaviors that uh, induce females to come, to, or, or males to come to the individual. So these are survival values, and dopamine allows the individual, the organism, to recognize those elements, where food is, where mates are. So this is what evolution intended. This is a system of reward that things like drug can hijack and take in different directions, in so, pathological directions. Mm -hmm. So dopamine, we have found recently, 
does not simply say something good in the environment has happened, but it says that you can expect that something good is going to happen. And that something, not only that, but something better than you expected is going to happen. And so whatever you've done, you should do it again. And you should keep doing that mm -hmm. in order to get to that result that is better than expected. In this way, habits can be formed within the brain where the um, animal can efficiently track through the environment to get to necessary goals. So humans aren't the only ones who have dopamine? Oh no, by no, okay. by no means, All right. no. All right, so it is shared. What is the difference between the first use of a drug for someone and a chronic use in regard to dopamine? The drug adapts, I mean, I'm sorry, the brain adapts. And particularly, we know from the principles of pharmacology that chronic drug administration causes adaptations that generally reduce the effect of the drug. The brain acts in a homeostatic manner. That is what I meant by regulatory. Mm -hmm. So if you disturb the brain in some way, perturb the brain in some way, it'll adjust to minimize that perturbation. In the case of dopamine and drugs that act on the dopamine system, for example, cocaine, which increases the level of dopamine, over time, the parts, the targets of dopamine, the receptors mm -hmm. that recognize the presence of dopamine, diminish because there is an excess of dopamine. So it compensates by diminishing the number of receptors. So does dopamine push things to be automatic? That is one of the major things that dopamine does, is it starts off a cycle in which behaviors that lead to a goal that is better than expected get repeated, get reinforced, and that over time, those behaviors can become more efficient. The neural activity becomes more efficient, mm -hmm. and so the environment, the cues in the environment that tell you that your goal is coming up, you can get to it very well, you can use less brain resources to do it, and in the case of humans, it becomes what we call automatic. automatic. You don't have to think about it. Give me an example. A good example is military training, that you learn how to react to a dangerous and stressful situation. Mm -hmm through a series of movements, through a series of actions that you don't have to think about, that you can do very quickly. For example, disassemble, reassemble your gun if it's, been, if it's jammed, even if it's in the dark, even if you can't see it. What about a golf swing? Golf swing is an excellent example. Golf swings are an excellent example, and they're very good as an example of what is a problem in treating addiction. People develop golf swings. After a while... Not that everyone who <laughs> plays golf is on drugs, but... No. Right. And, uh, you would hope that they were not. Right. Um, that they become practiced. Mm -hmm. They swing the golf club in a particular way. My mother and father played golf extensively. They paid a lot of money to golf pros to teach them to keep their elbow down, to keep their hips straight, to swing through the ball. However, if you have these actions that are well practiced, they become very hard to change. You're not even necessarily aware that you're moving your hips, that your elbow is held up. And so even though you go through a session with a coach, to practice these mm -hmm. new types of ways of swinging the ball, swinging at the um, golf club, you may revert back to those old ways. So let's bring this back now with somebody who is really deep into the throes of a drug. What, does it, what is it doing to them? Well, it's very important to understand that this is one critical 
component of the problem of addiction is this automatization of responses, of behaviors, and uh, uh, the automatic going for a drug and the, the seeking, drug seeking behavior. There is another component to drug addiction that uh, Steve alluded to at before that is very important to point out and highlight. Addiction is a, an ever expanding wave of dysfunction that is initiated in these areas of the brain that uh, work mainly with dopamine, the reward areas of the brain. But eventually, chronic use leads to more and more dysfunction in higher levels of the brain, higher cognitive areas, which are essentially the areas that keep taps on our impulses, our ability to inhibit impulses to reach for that second, third, or fourth cookie on the plate. So those areas of the brain, at the time that the drive to get to, to seek a drug are strengthened, the areas that, in, that are in charge of inhibitory control are weakened. So it's this imbalance between drive mm -hmm. for the fourth cookie or for the puff of a cigarette or for cocaine Whatever it might is be. increased, mm -hmm. the inhibitory control is significantly weakened. So, so how difficult is it to change for that person? Well, if you look at the protocols for treatment of addiction, uh, you, you can see that there are many principles that have distilled the, the wisdom of addiction research for the last couple of decades, three decades, something like that. Because the thinking and, is, just quit, just stop, just yeah, get away from it, exactly. remove them so from it. Detoxification of getting away from the drug is probably the first step. It's, we know that you need to be clean to initiate the process of therapy, but there are deeply entrenched circuitries in mm -hmm. the brain, maladaptive behaviors. The brain has learned to really depend on this drug for normal functioning. So the retraining of that, those circuits is as hard, as hard as unlearning your golf swing or your assembling and disassembling your weapon. Do we know how to start training someone to make that change? Not as well as we need to. We have many different types of treatment protocols, but it is difficult to have the person recognize all of the triggers in the environment that may start these habitual behaviors. And that when someone goes into a treatment center and learns these new skills, it is often difficult to to transfer those out into their regular environment. We have um, a number of different um, procedures that have been developed and have been tested by NIDA and have shown to be efficacious. However, we have also started to find out that differences in the brain may lead some people to be more responsive to these treatments than other people. Do we know a percentage of what that might be of the population of those who are involved with, with drugs and so forth? It turns out, if you look at the epidemiology data, that a large portion of people who are, have a lifetime exposure to drugs do not continue, do not progress to the stage of addiction. It is somewhere between 8 and 20 percent of people who are ever exposed to drugs go on to um, develop a full-blown problem with addiction. Just eight, between 8 and 20 percent of those who, okay. Is there a difference between dependence on a substance and addiction? Well, of course, dependence is a pharmacological term. It means that the brain has adapted to something new. It could be a prescription drug, for example, an opiate that you take for chronic pain, and the brain has adapted, and you need to increase the dose to achieve the same effects as, as the first doses. That's a dependence on a drug. It could be psychoactive drug, a psychoactive drug that, that causes this dependence of the brain. This is, the brain is adapting. Uh, but this is different from what we define addiction as, as the compulsive need mm -hmm. and a, a urge to seek a drug, mm. despite all the consequences. Well, we're going to continue our look into the origins of addiction and to get a better understanding of how everything fits together. Researchers at NIDA's IRP Labs are looking at individual components of brain cells. It's more of the science behind the science to better understand the origins of addiction. My name is Carl Lupica. I am a senior investigator and I am chief of the electrophysiology research section at NIDA. The lab primarily works with brain slices obtained 
from animals that have uh, either acutely or chronically been, been exposed to uh, abused drugs. And the neurons are still firing, synapses are still communicating with one another, mitochondria are still working, supplying energy to the cells. So all of the normal uh, respiratory processes that cells go through are still occurring in these neurons for many hours after we've made these brain slices. So the next step of the analysis is actually to attempt to identify these living neurons and brain slices. And that involves uh, passing infrared light through the microscope and then uh, utilizing some optical tricks to, uh, to look for neurons in these living brain slices. Essentially, we're using uh, amplifiers to take the small signals that, that all neurons generate and we're, we're making those signals bigger so that we can then monitor them and record them onto a computer. And the, the idea is that these neurons that shut off dopamine neurons may be involved in some of the aversive consequences that occur following the use of abused drugs. Well, this is absolutely fascinating. Steve, you had a comment to follow up on? Yes, um, what Dr. Lupik is um, working on is one of the most exciting new um, findings that we have, which is there is a system in the brain that actually not only turns on dopamine neurons, which is what we focused on mainly in drug addiction, but also turns off dopamine neurons. And these are under conditions where the outcome is worse than expected. Hmm. Over time, with chronic drug use, there seems to be one of the adaptations is when the drug is not present, the dopamine neurons are not as active as they are before. It may be due to the increase in activity in the neurons that um, he is studying. That will lead to feelings of dysphoria, to unease, anxiety, um, maybe something that um, lack of energy, depression, that the person now identifies that the solution to is to take more drug. Mm -hmm. So the drug initially gives you a high and then pushes you to one more. Pushes you below normal mm -hmm. and over time you stay below normal and you have to take the drug to get normal again. You have to take more? You may have to take, have more. To take more. Is everyone vulnerable to addiction? Well, uh, this is one of the key questions, of course, that uh, we would love to know the answer to. to identify why. who is. Well, obviously, uh, we know that uh, drug use is very different from drug addiction. We know a lot of people that use drugs, that have used drugs in their lives, but not everybody really becomes addicted. We know there is only a fraction of those that are exposed to drugs that ever become addicted. And we'd like to know why. Uh, the best analogy that I found to, to explain the difference, the individual differences of why some become addicted and some not, is that of to think of a, a human being as a stack of a Swiss cheese slices. Imagine each slice of our circumstances, our lives, uh, being separated between genetics, uh, early environment, childhood, parental style, our school environment, society, and so on. Are infinite there, are array there other of slices, slices besides this? Or, or? There are infinite, infinite number of slices, okay. all those that make really our lives or our circumstances, from the molecular to the political and social and, uh, contexts. So you can imagine that each of those slices has specific risks and protection factors. We may have good genes and bad genes that put us at higher or lower mm -hmm. risk for addiction. We may be in a good uh, parental environment or a bad parental environment, good neighborhood or bad neighborhood. So you can think that uh, addiction as the ability of the first exposure to a drug, the ability of that arrow of hazard to go through all the slices. And that's a rare event. It will be more often the case that one slice or another will be able to prevent the going through of that initial arrow of use. And Brilliant. that's why, in my mind, it's a good way to, to think about why not everybody gets addicted. Mm -hmm. Is there an addiction gene? It's not one addiction gene. It's like a complex, any complex behavior. There are many genes that affect all sorts of parameters. For example, the attitude that one has vis-a-vis -vis risk factors, mm -hmm. risk-taking behaviors. It's not one gene. It's many genes that make up that particular uh, type of uh, behavioral style. And risk-taking behaviors, the, the tendency of a person to engage in risky behaviors is one example of a major component, psychological component, that may drive one person uh, to seek uh, uh, drugs or to fall under peer pressure, for example. Are there differences between a normal brain and one that has been subject to 
different drugs, maybe it is, is an addicted brain. Are there differences? Yes, we, using the techniques of brain imaging as they've become more and more sophisticated over the last 20 years, we've been able to document numerous changes or differences between the brains of people who, are, who meet the criteria for addiction and those who, um, who are normal. And part of the research program that we're carrying out is trying to figure out which ones of the which of those differences may be due to pre-existing risk factors, which of these are due to adaptations to the drug, which ones may be critical to reverse um, to get a therapeutic effect. Are there common factors for people who have become addicted? Um, some of the common factors involved circuits in the brain involving the dopamine system, which um, lie underneath the cortex, a part mm -hmm. of the brain called the basal ganglia, where habits are, um, are generated. Another part of the brain involves the, um, a part of the brain called the anterior cingulate and the insula, which is very important in recognizing when things disturbing to the homeostatic um, internal environment has occurred. Do we know how drugs affect, uh, how the brain responds to temptations? How the brain responds to temptations? Mm -hmm. Temptations and the ability to make decisions. Well, uh, again, Steve is probably much better uh, prepared to answer this temptations. Is a, this is a <laughs> very, um, this is a, a very new area of research that has taken um, the combination of research in economics and research in, in brain function and put them together to see how does the brain make decisions? How does the brain assign value to various things in the environment? How does the brain choose between apples and oranges? And it turns out that the circuits that we're talking about, um, the dopamine circuit, the parts of the um, frontal cortex are very involved in these types of um, functions normally, and are these circuits are the ones that are changed in drug addiction. Mm -hmm. Did you have a follow-up comment? Uh, no, not really. Okay. Do drugs produce artificial consistencies? Uh, meaning? Well, uh, do we when we're talking about uh, the specific circuits that become impaired, uh, do they make us go down a, a, a particular path that we wouldn't normally go? Uh, well, yeah, of course. And uh, in this context, we also need to think about the specific effects of different drugs. We've been talking about, in general, drugs that affect things that uh, different drugs converge onto. For example, the dopamine system is one big funnel where many drugs have similar effects. But we also have to think about all the specific effects of different drugs. And going back to the genetics of drug abuse, for example, mm -hmm. nicotine is one of the best examples where we know genes that have specific effects, uh, specific vulnerability risk. Do we and have more studies, more information in regard to nicotine? Nicotine is probably one of the best examples in genetic studies that have shown specific vulnerabilities uh, that have to do with nicotinic receptors, that you wouldn't expect them to have a direct effect, impact on vulnerability to other drugs. So they have shown a very uh, significant impact of genetic uh, diversity in nicotinic receptors, for example. Okay. Well, we're going to take a very short break, and when we come back, we'll talk about what we can do with all of this information. better if I had cancer and you wouldn't tell me what I'm going through is just a phase you wouldn't see my condition as a lack of willpower but the disease that it truly is there'd be walks telethons campaigns to raise funds to end it if I had cancer you'd understand I need treatment not a lecture drug addiction is a disease learn how you can help someone you care about I'd rather have heart disease. That way you wouldn't look at me with shame. You and I could talk openly about my problem 
There would be no stigma. You could ask your friends how their family members got help. If I had heart disease, you would understand that I need treatment, not hate. Drug addiction is a disease. When you treat it that way, people can get better. Learn how you can help someone you care about. <laughs> Welcome back to our program on the origins of addiction. We've learned a lot about the brain and the origins of addiction. Now, in our final segment, let's talk about what we can do with this information. And again, joining me once again on the program, Dr. Reuben Baller and Dr. Stephen Grant. Let's go back to the PSAs we just saw. If I had cancer, you would treat me. If I had a heart condition, you would treat me. But drug addiction? What's your comment? Any comments to that? Drug addiction is perhaps one of the most stigmatized conditions that exists in our society today. And it is stigmatized because it is very difficult for people to parse out the moral components from it being a disease. Mm -hmm. For so long, we thought as drug addiction as being indicative of being a bad person. Drug addiction is not a being a bad person. Drug addiction is a disease like any other type of disease, but it affects those parts of the brain that are integral to being a person, that are integral to acting and interacting in society. So what can we do about it? Let me ask this question. Do, do memories, experiences that one person has had, does it, does it change the brain? Um, of course, everything that happens to the brain can change it. And this is why when we approach the problem of addiction, we need to think in an integral way. It's not just genes uh, and the early environment, but also the general environment. It's the school, it's the family, is the early stress, is the chronic stress, is the employment environment, is the relationship with our um, employees and our employers. Everything affects, and our memories, of course, set up the, the substrate onto which all these later experiences can either increase or decrease the risk for abuse and then addiction. Does it become one of the layers or some of the layers of the Swiss exactly. cheese? Exactly, it's one of the slices, and that's, that's why we talk about an addiction career or an addiction trajectory. This is made out of many different moments that either adapt to increased risk or to a resilient individual. Are the changes in a person, those memories, those things that take place, those experiences, are they permanent? We hope that they're not permanent. We would like that to find ways to reverse the changes that are associated with addiction. So is, is research being conducted to look into Absolutely. that? Absolutely. That's mm -hmm. one of our major focuses at this time, is to understand what changes in the brain and then how do those changes get restored back to a normative level. One issue that we have to confront is kind of a chicken and egg issue. That is, there may be a conditions in the brain that pre-exist before the person ever takes the drug that makes them vulnerable to progress to addiction, that there are holes in the Swiss cheese before the drug ever, the person is ever exposed to the mm -hmm. drug that makes them more liable to progress. So simply saying to them, just stop, doesn't do it. No more than it would have uh, having a tennis pro tell you to keep your elbows, just keep your elbows straight and then walk away. You mentioned earlier, just a short while ago, about it not being a moral failure. So much of what we've thought about in addiction is that these are bad people, they have bad morals, often because- Bad family, bad environment, bad everything. That's right, but also because the um, types of behaviors that people engage in in addiction because they are engaging in illicit activities many times, 
leads them to engage in criminal activities. They may rob, they may steal, they may do this to their own family. They are doing things that are not acceptable in our society. What is difficult to understand is that the process of drug addiction actually changes those parts of the brain that allows a person to evaluate whether they are acting in a moral way or in a way that's going to hurt them. Well, in hopes of finding ways to accelerate treatment and recovery, NIDA researchers are using brain scans to try and figure out exactly what parts of the brain we use for specific tasks. They're using the science behind the science to better understand the origins of addiction. I'm Thomas Ross. I'm a staff scientist in the neuroimaging research branch at the National Institute on Drug Abuse. So our branch uses brain imaging techniques to investigate uh, issues in drug abuse. Principally, we use a, a technique called functional magnetic resonance imaging. We do it in a way that's sensitive to changes in blood flow. So you can imagine that if part of your brain is working harder, then it will need more oxygen. So there'll be a local increase in blood flow. And we can set up our MRI machine so that it's sensitive to those local changes in blood flow. It shows us what parts of the brain are needed to do certain things. Maybe if I asked you to make a risky decision, I might want to know what part of your brain changes during that risky decision, and maybe that differs between a drug user and a non-drug user. And we will create an image where the color of, of the image is related to how big the blood flow change is. As we take these images across time, these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images, and combine them to make a single image that represents changes related to whatever we're looking at. So when you see these images of colorful, uh, we call them clusters or blobs, region of activation overlaid on top of a brain, those colors represent how big the signal change was. So we hope to better inform the scientific community what parts of the brain are important and critical in drug abuse so that they could be targets for either some sort of behavioral therapy or some sort of pharmacotherapy to help end drug abuse. Fascinating research. Science behind the science. Stephen, you had a comment. Yes, the ability to look at activity directly within the human brain has been one of the major advances that we've had in our fight against addiction. And Dr. Ross mentioned two things I think uh, bear upon the question that you asked before um, we saw that segment. He talked about risky decision making. One of the things that is associated with drug addiction is changes to those parts of the brain that are engaged in evaluating risk and, and how that would influence your decision making. Hmm. The second thing is the last picture that you saw that look like a big tangle of wires. Which is a 3D image. A 3D mm -hmm. image is the, the latest advance in brain imaging, which is looking at connections mm. between different brain areas. And we're finding out that it's not only changes in particular brain areas, but the connection between those brain areas, the ability of one brain area to communicate with another that is altered not only in addiction, but in many other psychiatric diseases. And that's part of what the neuron research was about in our other That's right. Piece. And mm -hmm. there is a massive project now going on called the Human Connectome Project that is intending to map out the connections in the human brain. How is the adolescent brain different from an adult brain? Well, this, this is a fascinating question. We talked before about the imbalances between the centers that drive impulses and behavior mm -hmm. and that higher cognitive part of the brain that allows us to inhibit those areas and to uh, seek a proper balance between drive and inhibitory control. The adolescent brain is not fully developed yet. This is a finding from the last 10 or 15 years from a, a, an investigator at the National Institute of Mental Health, Jay Gill, that found looking at prospective studies, cross-sectional studies of uh, individuals from five years old all the way to 20, 25 years old. Uh, and, and it's obvious that the uh, 
last part of the brain to really fully mature is the prefrontal cortex, which is in charge of this inhibitory control. All the time, this amygdala part, these limbic structures that are in charge of driving mm -hmm. these impulses are fully developed. So in a way, this adolescence, throughout adolescence, you have an imbalance that creates a gap, creates a risk for risky decision making. So the maturity that, of the brain isn't even there until what? It's not 24, there until 22, 25? 25, which is, by the way, something that car uh, rental insurance knew all along. If they just look at the tables of when do the accidents happen, they will charge you more huh. at, until you get to that age. So uh, this kind of tells us that teens then have perhaps a, a problem of making decisions. Well, we keep time. calling young people trouble, troublemakers or trouble kids. And in fact, the trouble is with societies, with environments that doesn't really give healthy outlets to that naturally, evolutionally driven risk-taking behaviors. This is something that is good throughout evolution. So this actually is a, as uh, Ruben alluded to earlier, this is an uh, part of the evolution of the brain. That during early childhood, there is an increase in plasticity of the brain. The brain is rapidly growing. It plateaus for a while, and then in early and then in adolescence, it starts becoming plastic and malleable again. It becomes open to changing with experience because the social context that the individual is going through, the transition from childhood to adulthood, is changing, and the brain needs to adapt to that. That means that the brain needs to experience a wider variety of um, it, types of behaviors and conditions. And this may lead to difficulties and bad mm -hmm. decisions, but we would also want it to hold, um, lead to learning those things that lead the person to be a good person in society. Ruben, what is the thing epigenetic? What is that? Epigenetics is a term that refers to changes in the genome, in gene expression that have nothing to do with mutations, with genetic changes. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew for a long time that the biology affects behavior. We also knew that environment can change behavior. Uh, what we were not particularly paying too much attention to is the fact that the environment can itself affect gene expression, affect the genome, without causing mutations. Uh, one analogy that I use to explain what epigenetic, this very fashionable uh, term is, is think about a couple of cars that came out of the factory in different countries, different dates, mm -hmm. uh, at different times. These two very different cars have obviously different blueprints, different genes. They will have different, very different time courses. Now, imagine two cars that came out of the assembly line at the same time, one after another, they are kind of twin cars. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the same factory, and they have obviously the same blueprints, the same genes. But if you look at these two cars, let's say 10, 12, 20 years later, you will see that they have very different performance. Even though they still have the same blueprint, the same genome, their performance, the, the way these engines are expressed or perform, is very different. And this is not because of changes in the blueprint, but this is because changes that the environment has impacted upon this blueprint. These are epigenetic genes that have to do with life experience, who the owner was, how well were these cars taken care of, and so on. So these are environmental yeah, impacts on the blueprint that we call epigenetic effects. And the drugs are notorious drivers of epigenetic changes. Something we haven't talked about is self-control. How does a drug, how do these drugs affect self-control? Well, the most um, obvious answer is that it erodes self-control, the, the ability of the person to stop taking the drug. This is the hallmark of drug addiction. Now you say erode. Does it totally remove it? Is it put, no. put off in the background? No, actually it is better thought of is that it refocuses self-control. It refocuses self-control on the acquisition and use of the drug to the exclusion mm. of other types of behavior. Wow, so it just, re, it just rechannels you back to that point. Yes. Hmm. Um, you had mentioned that uh, drug abuse, alcohol, so forth, are, are operational failure, not moral ones. Would you comment to that? Well, yeah. Uh, as I mentioned before, addiction really is a wave of dysfunction that starts with the reward system, uh, but it ends up impacting other circuitry in the brain, 
as Stephen just said, the self-control parts of the brain are key there. So when we read letters from uh, customers, clients, or patients, as, as we can say, uh, their sons uh, stealing their money from their drawers while they are burying a relative, for example, mm -hmm. we see these behaviors and we immediately seek an explanation in the realm of the moral failure, of a character flaw. But when we know through these fMRI images, through the studies in animals, uh, through molecular and genetic studies, what happens in the brain of, of these individuals that have been exposed for so many years to the devastating power of these drugs, we can actually see that the, the brain, the imbalances in the brain, that really allow us is what prompts us to call this an operational failure of the brain, different circuitry, that is compounded by the stigma that society imparts upon it. Just like there are parts of the brain that are responsible for us being able to hear or see, mm -hmm. there are parts of the brain that are responsible for us to make decisions. There are parts of the brain that are engaged when you have to make a moral, what we would call a moral decision. And those parts of the brains are impacted during the process of the development of drug addiction. Mm -hmm. Is a lack of self-control a warning sign? Absolutely. Actually, there are experiments that show that the, the first signs of a weak or less than optimal self-control can already pop up when an individual is three or four or five years old in, in toddlers. We can measure with simple cognitive experiments, psychological test batteries. You can test the strength of self-control. If the mother leaves the room, for example, mm -hmm. you can see how the baby reacts. Some of them will be restrained, will wait or kind of know that the mother will eventually come back. Some babies will completely will throw a tantrum right away and start crying until the mother comes back. So these are the first signs that self-control circuitry, like many other functions in the brain, have a very broad, very broad range of individual variability. And this is, as we are finding out, one of the most important uh, proxies or markers for risk later on in life. Are, are we born with a certain amount of self-control and then rely on the good news is others to teach us or, or uh, impress upon us? The good news is that self-control, like many other parts of the brain, it can change. The brain can learn to be able to exert more, or in the case of addiction, less, mm -hmm. self-control. There are people who have made a rough analogy between self-control and muscles that you can exert. Exerting too much self-control may lead to a fatigue and a failure of self-control in the short run. But you can also exercise self-control, and you can learn to exert more self-control over time. Why is it treatment is often so difficult for some people, and sometimes they relapse? But again, these circuits in the brain are very robust. Once you establish these maps of behaviors, these automatic behaviors, as we all know in many other realms of life, they're very difficult to, to get rid of. They are um, instantiated in a molecular processes that are very, very strong and very hard to erase, like memories, for mm -hmm. example, like traumatic mm -hmm. memories. Right. The same reason why PTSD is so difficult to treat. Do people need to hit absolute rock bottom before they can be treated? I is, like is there to, another, or is it? You go I ahead. like to say that everybody hits rock bottom. Everybody hits bottom throughout their life. Hitting bottom is an intrinsic way that the brain knows that whatever adaptations or behavior that is being used to cope with a certain situation is not working. The brain has circuits and systems that tell you when there has been a failure. And when there's been a failure, you need to change your behavior. So everybody, in a sense, hits bottom all the time. The question is, how deep is, do you have to go mm -hmm. before you hit that point where those circuits are engaged? One thing we're finding out is either that drugs and addiction are associated with impairments of those systems and circuits that tell you when you need to change. 
How can we remove some of that stigma attached to substance abuse? Well, I think that the key to removing stigma is understanding. It's exactly what we're doing here today, trying to disseminate trying to what really mm -hmm. happens in the brain of these individuals that have been unlucky enough that uh, all those holes in the Swiss cheese stack of sli the slices mm -hmm. are, were aligned in a way that allowed that initial use to go through and cause a full-blown addiction. This is just a la lack of luck, not a lack of moral fiber or character. Hmm. Is it imp important for us to really understand that this is a disease? It is essential for us to understand that drug addiction is a condition, whether you call it a disease or whether you have another term for it, that people can overcome, that there are treatments, they may be difficult, they may take enormous amounts of time and effort, but there are treatments and people can overcome addiction to drugs. Is that some of the stigma with it? Because it's going to take so much time, so much energy, so much effort. Yes. Not only by the person themselves, mm. but by their families and maybe by the larger social community. So what's next in research regarding this? Well, there are many facets that we're actively investigating. One of the facets, the dimensions that we haven't talked too much about is comorbid conditions, for example, and that also feed into this area of stigma. We know that a, a majority, pretty much a majority of people that are afflicted by addiction also may have either overt or underlying other mental illnesses like depression or schizophrenia. And one of the leading theories is that many of the cases of addiction really are cases of people trying to self-medicate. And they are pushed into this uh, scenario because the system has failed to diagnose or identify those that are more vulnerable. So I think that one of the messages is that this society's role really to identify as early as possible those kids in school that may present with problems or with underlying vulnerabilities that show uh, uh, abnormal behaviors or aberrant behaviors that may signal that they might fall prey to this problem of addiction later on in life. Dr. Baller, I'll let that serve as your final thought. Stephen, will you please give us your final thought regarding our discussion today? Well, I will just um, expand a little bit on what Ruben said, and that the use people use drugs for a number of reasons. They use drugs not only to get high and for recreational purposes, but they use it for relief. And that relief may be as much of a problem or cause as much of a problem as the recreational use, the euphoria. And quickly have a little bit more time. What can we change? Well, I think that society has a very huge responsibility here. We said that it, addiction is not a moral failure, and I call it a system failure. We have to look at all those slices and recognize that we have a responsibility to protect our kids, particularly our adolescents. We know that early initiation has this dramatically higher risk of becoming an addiction. So we have to do a better job at the educating and protecting our young mm -hmm. people. Any follow-up with that, Stephen? And that we provide the me ways and means for people to channel the um, types of things that they do get from drugs into other types of activities, whether those activities may involve providing the relief for conditions that they um, are seeking or to provide the recreational types of activities that will be beneficial in the long run. Well, very good, gentlemen. I do appreciate it. That is all the time that we have for today. For Drs. Ruben Ballard and Stephen Grant, I'm Stan Rhodes. Thanks for watching The Origins of Addiction.